Where's heaven? Which way do you go to get to heaven? Sometimes we go into the school rooms, you know, and we see the little children there, just really little children, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and we say, who wants to go to heaven? Every hand goes up. It's kind of we're hardwired for high heaven. And then you say, where is heaven? And they point to the sky. And we do the same thing, wouldn't we? Where's heaven? It's up in the sky, you know. Where do we get that from? That heaven is up in the sky. Well, there's several passages in the Bible that point to that. And we heard three of them today. Our first reading, Acts of the Apostles, and angels seen as two men are there and they ask the apostles this question at the day of the ascension. Why are you standing there looking up at the sky? This Jesus who has been taken up from you into heaven will return in the same way as you have seen him going into heaven. Our second reading, St. Paul. He's recounting the Father's mighty actions. And he includes this, raising Jesus from the dead and seating him at the right hand in the heavens, far above every principality. In our gospel just proclaimed, St. Luke tells us how Jesus raised his hands, blessed his apostles, and as he blessed them, he parted from them and was taken up to heaven. In just a few moments, we'll pray together our Nicene Creed. That's the summary of what we believe as Catholic Christians. And we're going to say these sentences. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And then we say, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. Indeed, the feast day we celebrate today is called the Ascension. And so indeed, we have this image of heaven as being somewhere up there in the sky. We're here on earth, and heaven is somewhere up there in the sky, which might make us think that since Jesus was taken up into heaven, that he's away from us. We're here. He went to heaven, so now he's there, and he's away from us, his brothers and sisters. Well, I'd like to share with you another idea on where heaven is. And this insight comes to us from Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. He's the Pope previous to Francis. He is still alive. He's kind of retired, but he had some great writings, a lofty theologian. And here's what he wrote. It would be a mistake to interpret the ascension as a temporary absence of Christ from the world. Rather, we go to heaven to the extent that we go to Jesus Christ and enter into him. He concludes, Jesus himself is what we call heaven. Wow. Have you ever thought about that before? What a beautiful insight that is to contemplate. We go to heaven to the extent that we go to Jesus Christ and enter into him. This means that heaven would not be some place just up in the sky. Heaven would be where Jesus is. Where is Jesus? Jesus can be anywhere he wants to be. But where does he want to be? He wants to be with us. He loves us. He says in Scripture, I will never leave you. I will not leave you orphans. I'll be with you to the end of the age. Where is Jesus? He promises to be with us, his people, his brothers and sisters. Where is Jesus? Well, you know, when he was here, he instituted seven sacraments. And in all seven sacraments, his power is there for us. Oh, we're so blessed. Baptism, all of the sacraments. And so the power of Jesus is there in all seven sacraments. And thanks to the miracle that he performed at the Last Supper, he established to be perpetuated a sacrament where both his power and his presence would be there for us. It's there in the Eucharist that Jesus is truly and substantially present to us, his people. And that's why we call the Eucharist the most blessed sacrament. There's seven. They're all blessed. But we refer to as the Eucharist, we say that is the most blessed sacrament. If you're on the highway and you go to the shrine for EW10, it says the shrine 
of the most blessed sacrament. It's there that they have full-time adoration of our Lord in the Eucharist, and it's there that they have the Eucharistic Museum. The Eucharist is the power and the presence of Jesus Christ among us. Jesus is present there, what we can say, sacramentally. We can't see him with our eyes, but we know he's there because he said he's there. He is veiled under the appearance of bread in the Holy Eucharist, and, in the, and the precious blood is there in the wine. He's veiled under the wine in the two uh, means that we can receive him in Holy Communion. And because of this, we can accurately say that the Eucharist is a foretaste of heaven. The Eucharist is a foretaste of heaven because it is a foretaste of Jesus, our Holy Communion. We can't see him, but we believe his words. At the Last Supper, he said, take and eat, this is my body. He blessed it, broke it, gave it to him and said, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup filled with wine, he blessed it and gave it to him and said, take and drink, this is my blood. And they did. They consumed him. And then he gave them the power. He said, do this in memory of me. And that power has been handed on to this day where an unworthy priest stands at the midst of the altar and calls down the Holy Spirit to do the transubstantiation of the elements of bread and wine. And through the power of the Holy Spirit and the hands and the words of the priest, the elements of bread and wine become the true presence of Jesus, the Holy Eucharist. He is with his people. That means that the Eucharist is really heaven on earth. Where is heaven? Is it just up in the sky? No. It's here on earth in the Eucharist. Everyone says they want to go to heaven. Well, actually, we do go to heaven every time you come forward to receive our Lord worthily in Holy Communion. Or more accurately, heaven comes to you in Holy Communion. And that's why I often describe, and I open the Mass this day, I said, we're here for the celebration of the mystery of the Mass. This is where heaven meets earth. God comes to us. Divinity comes to humanity. Heaven meets earth in the mystery of the Mass. Do you think of that when you return to your pew after receiving our Lord in Holy Communion? Do you think about that? Do you realize how special it is to receive him, God, into your body. At that moment, when he's still there, as long as it's the host, he's still there. And once the host dissolves, he's not there sacramentally. But for that period of time, he is there, and you have a foretaste of heaven with the living Lord here. What are you saying to Jesus in those moments when you go back to your pew after you receive Holy Communion, what are you saying? You know, we had a retreat four years ago with our youth, high school youth. We went away to a nice retreat camp in Cook Springs, and I asked the question, we're talking about Holy Communion. I say, what do you guys say? There were 30. What do you guys say when you go back to your seats or your pews uh, after Holy Communion? No one raised their hand. No one. What does that mean? Maybe they weren't catechized. Maybe they weren't instructed. Maybe they weren't encouraged to contemplate the mystery that that Holy Communion is not a symbol of our unity in Christ. That Holy Communion is Him. And what do you want to tell Jesus? Thank you, thank you, thank you for my parents, for my life, for my health. Lord, please help me in my journey. Please help me with my spouse. This is the time to be in communication with Him because He's really there. Wow. And to go back to your pew with that intention, I am going to take this time. I don't care who's coming to Holy Communion. I'm not going to watch the next guy in line. I'm not going to watch Father purify the vessels. He does that at every Mass. What I'm going to do is have conversation with my God. In the seminary, I was there for five years, and I decided on the first day I'm going to sit within the first three rows so that when I receive communion, I have all that time, while everybody else receives communion, I have all that time to be with him. It is so sweet. That's a regret of being a priest, because as soon as I receive communion, I have to go about distributing communion and be with you. What a privilege that you can go back to your pew and have that time with Jesus, that intimacy. 
Every one of you should sit in the front pews. <laughs> There'd be another reason to sit up closer. But it is a good reason. And no matter what, no matter what, take the time and understand and comprehend the mystery. It is a mystery. It is a miracle. But he's there. He said, it's me. Where is heaven? Heaven is wherever Jesus is. Where is Jesus? Jesus is in the Eucharist. And then you get to have that privileged time with him at every Holy Communion. You know, all throughout the scriptures, God has revealed to us his desire to be with us. He loves us. He created us in love. His one desire is that we would be with him in love forever. He made us for himself. Just two Sundays ago, we heard this proclaimed at Sunday Mass. It was from the book of Revelation. God, behold, God's dwelling is with the human race. Where is his dwelling? With the human race. God himself will always be with them as their God. I don't know about you, but I find that so reassuring. Do you know there are other worldwide religions? And they can't say this. The Jews, they love God. And they're still waiting for God to come and be among them. They're still waiting for the Messiah. Do you know the Muslims, they love God. But to them, Allah is distant. He is remote. He is transcendent. He is not imminent. He is up there. He's never said he's coming here, and he hasn't been here to them. And that's why in the fullness of time, God, the one God, they call him Allah, we call him God Father, he sent his son so that we could comprehend that he is not master slave, he is father children. And he wants to be with us now and forever. And so he comes to us. He sent his son in the flesh, the word made flesh. And then his son instituted the great sacrament of the Eucharist so his son could be with us all time till the end of time. Understanding God's desire to be with us should wipe away any thought that the ascension that we celebrate today, the ascension of Jesus to the Father in heaven, marked the beginning of a temporary absence of Christ from the world. Far from it. Jesus is definitely not absent from the world. Yes, he's in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he's also here with us in earth. He is present on every altar in every Catholic church all over the world. He is present in every tabernacle where we repose the Blessed Sacrament. That's a miracle. Do you know there are certain men and women in time who have been privileged to be able to buy, locate. Buy means two. They could be in one place and in another place at the same time. One of my favorite modern day saints is Padre Pio. He died in 1969. And he had the gift to be here in Northport and here in Tuscaloosa. And people would say, no, he was here. And we say, no, he was here. He was in the same, different places at the same time. Would you call that a miracle? That's a huge miracle. It's called by locating. Well, Jesus can be anywhere he wants. Remember, Scripture says he came through locked doors, and he was there, and then he wasn't there, and this and that. He has the ability to be anywhere he wants. He wants to be with us. And so he's way more than two places. He is in the Catholic churches all over the world at this moment, on altar after altar after altar, in tabernacle, tabernacle. He is everywhere. That's God. Oh, what a privilege that he is here with us sacramentally. Jesus isn't just up in heaven. He is here with us too. God is with his people as he promised. Now, since we believe that Jesus was fully human and fully divine, we call him the God-man. He came to us. He was fully man and fully divine. Since we believe that, then we would say that in the ascension, Jesus took our humanity and brought it into the inner life of God in a brand new way. Remember, he came to us. He took on our humanity. He rose from the dead in a glorified, resurrected body. We just heard how he was with his apostles for the last time, and he was lifted up. He took his glorified, resurrected body into the inner life of the Trinity. Wow. God wasn't just with his people. Now his people were with God because he took his humanity to the Father. 
So rather than Jesus' ascension being viewed as some temporary separation from us, the ascension signifies that now we have a new intimacy with God because of what Jesus did. Wow. Jesus took our humanity and brought it to the Trinity. The ascension reveals that, God is, that man has found a very, very special, everlasting place in God. And this is a reason for great joy. We just had our responsorial psalm. It's a beautiful responsorial psalm filled with joy. And one of the stanzas was, that we prayed was this, All you peoples, clap your hands. Shout to God with cries of gladness. Why would we do that? Why did they say to do that? Because God loves us, and he's with us here, not just there. He's here. In the gospel, the, Jesus rose, to the, rose up, and then as he parted from the apostles, Luke tells us, as he was taken up to heaven, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy. If someone left you whom you loved, you'd probably be in tears. You moms that send your children off to military and they go off to school and they leave you and it's like, oh, I'm so sad. And they weren't sad. They had the gift, the awareness to comprehend that yes, he returned to the Father and he's still with us here. We can pray mass every day. He's there and he's here. And so scripture says, they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and every day they were in the temple speaking about the love of Jesus Christ. Jesus wants all of us to be with him forever in the kingdom of heaven where we'll be with the Father and him and the Holy Spirit for all time. As a result of Easter, we say the gates of heaven are now open. How do we enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, let's remember the words of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI. We go to heaven to the extent that we go to Jesus Christ and enter into him. Think about that. The gates of heaven are open. In scripture, Jesus says, I am the gate. He says that. He said, I am the narrow gate. And when we enter into the narrow gate, we're entering into heaven. Jesus is eternal life. And our goal is to enter into him more intimately every day till one day we're with him forever. Many people want to go to heaven and many people look for the fulfillment of heaven here on earth. It's not here on earth. And for those of us who have gotten a little bit of age, we know it's definitely not here. With the suffering and the sadness and the sickness and the death and the setbacks and the trials and tribulations, and we think we're going to find heaven here, well, heaven is not here in its fullness. God wants us to have eternal happiness. He say joy. Jesus says, I came that you would have joy and that your joy would be complete. Our joy will be complete when we're with him forever in eternity. And expect that it's going to be here now. That's just not going to happen. Notice that the risen Jesus himself, he didn't stay here long. After he rose from the dead, Luke says 40 days. And after 40 days, he ascended to the Father. By leaving the earth and ascending to be with the Father, Jesus clearly showed us where our focus should be not on the things of this earth, but on the things of heaven that endure forever. And Jesus wants each and every one of us to be with him, which means he wants us to be in heaven. He is heaven. He is the gate to heaven. Recall how many times in Scripture Jesus says, come follow me. He said it to Peter. He said it to so many, come, come follow me. Well, if a person says that, that means that they're trying to lead you somewhere. Where is Jesus trying to lead us? He says, follow me. He's trying to lead us to the Father. And when we get to the Father, we're home. Who designed that? God the Father wants us to be with him in heaven, but he wants us to come to him through his Son. Remember the transfiguration. This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. Jesus, um, the Father wants us to enter the kingdom of heaven through his Son, Jesus, who is the gate to the kingdom of heaven. What direction do we go? Is it just really up in the sky? No, not exactly. It's wherever Jesus is. So to go to heaven, we need to go to Jesus. 
Great saint of the church, St. Catherine of Siena, put it this way. She said, heaven is here for all those on their way to heaven. Wow, what a mysterious thing. And for everyone in this room, if you believe that Jesus is Lord, if you believe that he's in the Eucharist, then heaven is here for all of those on the way to heaven. He's there and he's here. It's like, wow, this is so great. She had it right. Heaven is here for all those on their way to heaven. And if Jesus is heaven and we receive him in Holy Communion, heaven is here in our soul. Because when we receive him, we receive the bread of life. We call it the bread of angels. We call it the bread of heaven. Holy Communion. Wow. As we celebrate the feast of our Lord's ascension into heaven, let's realize that Jesus is there and here. He can be anywhere he wants. He's there with the Father, and he's here with us. He never really left us. As Savior and Lord, Jesus now reigns in heaven at the right hand of his Father. As brother and friend, Jesus is still here on earth with all of us to nourish us with himself. He feeds us with the bread of life, the bread of heaven, which is him. He feeds us to nourish us. He washes our soul with his mercy in the sacrament of confession. He wants us to enter ever more deeply into him and then finally reside with him and the Father in the kingdom of heaven forever. Do you want to find your way to heaven? Remember, we go to heaven to the degree that we go to Jesus and enter into him.